By early morning, the clouds are already being contaminated by the radioactive column rising 1,000 meters into the sky. Igor Kostin was a photographer with the news agency Novosti. When a friend and helicopter pilot phones him that morning to offer to fly him over Chernobyl, all Kostin knows is that something has happened at the plant during the night. He is the first journalist to witness the gate when we got close to block four and circled around it, I had no idea of the risk. When we flew over the block, I opened the window of the helicopter. I didn't realize then what a big mistake that was. The thin, translucent, smoky seas rising from the ruins is in fact highly radioactive. Kostin is one of the few Chernobyl reporters on the scene in the early hours of the accident to have survived serious exposure to radiation. When I opened the window, I couldn't hear a thing. The ruins of the reactor were below me. I felt like I was floating in space, like in a tomb, a real dead silence. I couldn't even hear the helicopter anymore, nothing, a black hole, a tomb and deathly silence. This is the first picture ever taken of the breach. All my equipment jumped after a minute. I couldn't understand what was going on. I thought my batteries were dead. I only managed to take a dozen photos. Once I returned to Kyiv, I processed my pictures and I noticed the negatives were black and the colors very poor. I didn't know it yet, but the photos had been exposed to radioactivity. At the core of the blown-out reactor, and buried under 14 meters of rubble, the graphite surrounding the nuclear fuel burns and melts the uranium. The radioactive fallout is going to be a hundred times greater than the combined power of the two atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the Kremlin, eight hours after the explosion, Gorbachev only has scant information on the situation. The first information consisted of accident and fire. Not a word about an explosion. At first, I was told there hadn't been an explosion. The consequences of such false information were particularly dramatic. For Pripyat's 43,000 inhabitants, life goes on as usual. They know nothing of the disaster three kilometers away. The information we got was that everything was sound, including the reactor. When I asked the academician Alexandrov, he told me the reactor was absolutely safe. It could even be set up on a red square. It wouldn't be any different than a samovar, like putting a kettle on red square. There are rumors in the town of a fire at the plant and deaths in the night, but no official information has been released. The white flashes on these images are the results of radioactivity on the film. People in the streets hardly blink an eye at the masked soldiers scattered throughout the city. Colonel Grebenyuk led the troops in charge of controlling the situation. There was a metallic taste in our mouth, an acidity. They say radiation has no taste. 
It was only later we realized it was the taste of radioactive iodine. While children are still out playing in the squares, Colonel Grebenyuk's men spend the day taking the first readings of radioactivity in the city. In those days, radioactivity was measured in units called ronjons. Normal atmospheric level is about 12 millionths of a ronjon. In Pripyat, by early afternoon, readings are already over 200 thousandths of a ronjon. In other words, 15,000 times higher than usual. By the evening, the level has shot up to 600,000 times above normal. Boulevard Lenin, 200. Boulevard Ukraina, 250 milli ranjans. And that night, seven ranjans. My subordinates were starting to wonder if the machines were working properly or was someone lying to us. We did not know that the reactor was still burning and radiation was still spreading. This map is sealed in plastic because it's still radioactive. It's thought that a human being can absorb up to two ronjons per year without being affected. But the body is lethally contaminated if it receives over 400 ronjons. During that first day, the inhabitants absorb over 50 times what is considered to be a harmless dose. Such a pace, they would have received a lethal dose in four days. To understand what is going on, the colonel sends a patrol to take the first readings at the base of the plant. Their first readings were recorded on this map, 2080 Ranjans. I was worried about my subordinates. How could I send them in there? At these astronomical levels, 15 minutes is all it takes for a human being to absorb a lethal dose of radiation. At the Nuclear Institute, the figures provoke a shock. Such a level of radioactivity has never been seen before. Gorbachev hurriedly creates a governmental commission made up of the country's top experts in nuclear energy. This is led by the academician Legasov, a nuclear physicist of international renown. He immediately leaves for Chernobyl at the head of a scientific delegation. We hoped they would be able to evaluate the situation quickly, but for the first couple of days, they weren't able to tell us anything. It was a dramatic situation. We'd be in session, waiting for information. We were demanding information, but they weren't able to tell us anything. 20 hours after the explosion, the level of radioactivity continues to climb. By now, windows and doors should be sealed and iodine tablets swallowed to counteract the effects of radioactivity. Yet no such orders have been given. Despite rising tensions in the city, the population has still not been informed of the situation. Yulia Marchenko was only five at the time. She lived in Pripyat with her family. Her father worked at the plant. My parents took me to the daycare center, like usual. Everything was absolutely normal. My father already knew there'd been an accident, but no precautions had been taken yet. 30 hours after the explosion, the first security measures are enforced. More than 1,000 buses have arrived. At 2 p.m., the army announces the city is to be completely evacuated. I remember the teachers at the kindergarten gave us iodine pills. Then parents came to pick up their kids. Everyone was running around, but they weren't panicking. We thought we were only going to be gone for three days. To avoid any panic, the authorities conceal the seriousness of the situation. Inhabitants are given two hours to gather their belongings and assemble in front of their buildings. 
They told us to get in the buses. I remember perfectly well having to choose which toys I was going to take. I had a lot of dolls and wanted to bring them all, but I couldn't. We couldn't even take any warm clothes. People have to leave everything they own, their entire lives behind. They will never return. One old man didn't want to go. He stayed behind. They found his body a few weeks later. People didn't really believe what was happening. They thought they were being lied to. They remembered the German occupation and said that in 1941 there were bombs that fell. But now there was nothing. The elderly people didn't believe in an invisible enemy. And there was no time to explain. My soldiers and I were simply carrying out orders. In three and a half hours, 43,000 people are evacuated tearfully but peacefully. Buses carry Europe's first atomic refugees. They have been exposed to doses of radiation that may alter the composition of their blood and engender fatal cancers. Forty-eight hours after the disaster, the only people left in the ghost town are the military personnel and members of the scientific delegation, headquartered at the Pripyat Hotel. As if unaware of the danger, they eat, sleep and work right on the premises. These were upstanding people, specialists. I couldn't believe they would do something irresponsible or suicidal. No, it made